for the long gaps between reviews of prose fiction. So to make up for that, this time I have a review this week of The Legend of Drizzt, The Collected Anthology, a collection of short stories written by R.A. Salvatore, set in the Forgotten Realms, and featuring characters directly or indirectly related to Salvatore's Drizzt story and series of novels. For the purposes of this review, I'll be discussing the audiobook adaptation, in part because Audible.com gave the book away as a freebie a while back, and that's the way I experienced the book. For their anthology, Audible hired a variety of celebrity actors to read the book, along with some traditional audiobook readers. These readers' performances are obviously something that can affect one's enjoyment of the book, so I'll be including that in my discussion of the works. Being that this is a selection of short stories, as opposed to just one coherent narrative book, novel, book. I'm going to instead break the stories down into three categories based on how they left me. Hot, stories which had me excited and entertained. Comfortable, stories which were fun and left me kind of laid back, where I could, if I came to them laid back and relaxed, I came back in the same, I came away from them in the same situation, and they'd be kind of pick me up a little bit if I was having a rough time. And cold, stories which just didn't work for me for one reason or another. And I'll, for all of these, I will generally get into why. The cold. The stories in this category are ones which didn't quite work for me, for various reasons, ranging from the reading to the subject matter of the story. First off, there is The Third Level, read by Greg Guenberg. This is a story which I'd read before, which covers Artemis and Trieri's early days in the Calimport Thieves Guild. There are parts of it that work well. The centerpiece of the story, a trial between Intriri and his mentor involving a form of Russian roulette with poison, is very nicely done, and the reader, Gunberg, is very good at his job. And it's clear that the central conceit of this story, um, the Russian roulette part, is the part that Salvatore drew, really got into, and the part that drove him to wrote the whole story, and the part that worked best in his head. And... The reading carries that out. However, bookending that portion, we get Intriri walking the streets of Calimport before his recruitment and then after, reminiscing about his life before he came to Calimport and the price of his rank in the guild and whether he thought it was worth it. These bits feel shoehorned in, like Salvatore went, okay, this is about me, my one secret origins of Intriri story, so I have to get everything in here or that he felt that the story didn't quite read the, meet the word count it needed to be included in the short story collection where it first appeared, so he had to stretch it out some. And unfortunately, the direction he chose to pad it out in doesn't quite work. From here, we get into stories where the narrative is solid, but there are parts of the readings which fall flat. The Dowry is a great example of this. This story focuses on Dritzt and Katie Bree, in Waterdeep, as they attempt to pull a sting operation on some pirates, only end up in an entirely different situation than what they expected. This is a general narrative concept it, that's executed well. It's a classic. It's been done plenty of times before. The sting operation that catches a sting operation, or which catches something else entirely. However, we, the, or the reader of the story, Melissa Rauch, has some problems with their performance. In particular, her voice she gives Katie Bree. She overplays Katie Bree's Irish accent to something that's rather grating by pitching her voice a little too high. By the midpoint of the story, I found myself wishing that perhaps, instead of casting Rouch to read the story, they'd gotten, say, Gabrielle Anwar from Burn Notice instead, as her Irish accent fits Katie Bree a little better. It's a little deeper in voice. The worst example of a bad performance ruining a good story is with the story To Legend He Goes, read by David Duchovny. This story is about old man Wolfgar, the barbarian, going out like a freaking boss in battle with some yeti at the age of a hundred. It's a good story written very well, and Duchovny wake freaking reads it like he's baked out of his goddamn mind. It's like he can't muster a single fuck to give towards the story, that he approached the gig with the mindset that the check from Audible cleared, and that, yeah, they can pay him to read the story, but they can't pay him to care. Consequently, what should have been the best piece of the collection, indeed the story that caps off the collection, the final story in the book, falls flat. I understand 
that there are roles that you take just for the money. When it comes to performances like this, I've noticed there are two different tacks I've seen taken by actors in this situation. The best way to do this is the tack taken by Jeremy Irons in the Dungeons and Dragons movie and Christopher Plummer in Star Crash. You go, screw it, I am going to overact the hell out of this role, and I am going to leave no scenery unchewed. Consequently, because of these performances, because of how over the top they are, because of how much these great actors overact, they are memorable and they are saved and made cult classics because of their performance. As bad as the Dungeons & Dragons movie is for the performances by Damon Wayans and various other elements, people remember Jeremy Irons' performance for all the faults of the bad effects in Star Crash and some of the ludicrousness of the plot and the fact that it's a blatant ripoff of Star Wars. People remember Christopher Plummer going, Imperial Battleship, halt the flow of time. But on the other hand, an actor can just go, I don't care, you can't make me care, I'm just going to sleepwalk through this role, at which point they can turn even the most exciting film, where everyone else in the movie is excited, into a potent sleep aid. I just can't help but wonder who Audible called before David Duchovny to read this story, because I really can't think of a worse performance they could have gotten than this one. The Comfortable. These are the stories that aren't necessarily mind-blowing, but are enjoyable and fun to read or have read to you. The first of the two E and J, Artemis and Truri and Jarlaxel stories, is a perfect example of this. The story, That Curious Sword, read by Danny Pewdy of Community, has the two getting set up on a heist and also gets into the origin of Intruri's sword. It's not the best e and story of the, of the two in the collection, we'll get to that one later, but it is a fun and enjoyable experience nonetheless. Similarly, The First Notch, read by Felicia Day, falls into this category. It's the earliest story in the collection, both in terms of publication dates and where it falls in the chronology, telling how Buenor Battlehammer got the first notch in his axe. It's a excitingly done story with some nice characterization to it. It just works perfectly. Now, of these stories, the most serious and more philosophical, though not without its combat, is Bones and Stones, which is read by Al Yankovic, as in Weird Al Yankovic. The story is set after the Siege of Mithra Hall by Obuld Many Arrows during the Hunter's Blades trilogy, with the battle rager Thibbledorf Pwent going to look for the body of the son of one of his friends, and the process running into the an orcish soldier looking for the body of his daughter. With the two characters being on opposing sides of the conflict but having common goals, the story ends up providing a great deal of humanization to the orcs and builds off of some of the material in two of the other stories we'll get into, in this collection under the hot. As I mentioned, the story is read by Al Yankovic, and while he's a comedic actor, if you look at his just straight filmography, not to mention his musical work, he handles the more serious and more somber material of this very well, finding a really good voice for Puent. The problem the story runs into is both the structure of the story and how it adapts from the page to an audiobook format. The main plot is excerpt with a is interspersed with excerpts of Dritt's diary as he discusses the cost of war and compares an experience, his experience of the going to war with his experiences in venturing and how the two things work and how you're going out to fight with both. But the structure of which, where you're, go, you're on the one hand, you're going with an army and bringing a whole bunch of people who you don't necessarily personally know versus getting with a bunch of your personal friends, basically, and your call at colleagues and people who you trust implicitly, who knew the risks and know exactly what they're getting into, and how he's okay with going adventuring but not with going to war, and between all of this, Al having to balance between Dritt's voice, Puent's, droid, um, Puent's voice, and the York's voice. Now again, on that page, that structure works. When read, it doesn't work as well, as you have two radically different narrative voices, in fact, three radically different narrative voices, speaking from different times, contrasting and coming into conflict with each other instead of being in harmony. It's something where, theoretically, it could work as, like, a audiobook fugue, but doesn't pan out that way 
due to how this particular narrative is structured. Now, probably the best of the comfort stories is Guenhevar, which tells the story of how Dritt's magical animal companion was created. The story does a great job of setting up a pair of characters who had previously never existed in Salvatore's Forgotten Realm stories, if indeed not in anyone else's Forgotten Realm stories for that matter, and building a world around them and developing their characters while also telling the main thrust of the story, how the panther was created, how Guinevar became who she is. The Hot These are the best stories of the collections. The stories where I found myself having to stifle open, laugh, open laughter in public, where everything in the story clicked in something that encapsulates why Salvatore has such a following, particularly in some cases where the story and the reader meshed in ways that worked perfectly and in some ways that I couldn't have imagined coming into it. First off is the second of the two E&J stories, Wickless in the Nether, read by Sean Astin, who you may know from the Lord of the Rings series where he played Samwise Gamgee, or before that, Rudy, or the Goonies. The story falls in Triria and Jarlaxle as they end up caught in a feud between two nobles, both harboring a rather surprising secret. The story really plays up the buddy heist action comedy nature of the e &J stories, and highlights the chemistry the characters have, making for a really funny story on its own accord. And then there's the reading by Sean Astin. As you go through the story, you can sort of hear Austin feeling out the characters and finding their voices. From the story's opening scene with Inchuri buying a mysterious candlestick in a curio shop, to the subsequent scene where we have Inchuri and Jarlaxle in their apartment together, you can hear Austin find Inchuri and Jarlaxle's voices, making the presentation of the story not just a really fun and enjoyable yarn, but also a great way to kind of hear the actor's craft and action. Next up is Dark Mirror, by Dan, uh, read by Dan Harmon. This is, in the collection, the first of the three more philosophical stories in the book, followed by Comrades in Odd, at Odds, and finally Bones and Stones, the latter of which I've already discussed. The story is set a little after Dritt's party has recaptured Mithra Hall and become known as the Companions of the Hall, and has Dritt encountering an orcish raiding party while on the way from Mithra Hall to Silvery Moon. When Dritz and some farmers rescuing the prisoners of the raiders um, take up the main action set piece of the collection, the meat of the story comes from one of the prisoners, the goblin slave of one of the farmers, and how Dritz reacts to this. The narrative climax of the story isn't a fight, but it's a conversation between Dritz and the goblin, Nojaim. Dritz recognizes something of himself in Dojaim, who is a goblin who rejects the more monstrous reputation and behavior of his people, and who is indeed very intelligent. But Dritz fails to understand, well, the concept of passing privilege. As laid out in the story, Dojaim points out that both of them are judged based on the reputation of their races, but not as many people have encountered drow firsthand, whereas more people have had first-hand or even second-hand knowledge of goblins and their raids, and maybe even lost friends and family to goblins. And for that matter, drow have a considerable amount, considerable amount visually in common with other elven races, which are generally described as being attractive, giving Dritz a level of exoticism that most people become more inclined to tolerate him because of that. Especially once they've made from been made familiar with him or through his reputation with his assistance in reclaiming Mithril Hall. By contrast, Nojaim is a goblin and will always be considered horrific and ugly by the rest of the world, and the ubiquity of goblin raids on settlements across Ferun, if not all of Toril, means that his appearance will always be a reminder to people of a trauma that they or theirs have suffered in the past. It's not as graceful as a take on some of the problematic elements of villainous races in fantasy fiction that I like. Actually, um, Bones and Stones fares better at this. But it works. It's a start. And it's a concept that is, ha that, again, is handled better in Bones and Stones. And I'm interested in seeing how well it's covered in the Hunter's Blade series. The second story in the collection that covers these themes, and the third that I've discussed thus far, is Comrades at Odds, which is read by Ice-T. The story, like Bones and Stones, 
is also set following the siege of Mithra Hall by Obuld Many Arrows. The story follows Dritz and a moon elf named Inovendil going to retrieve the body of another moon elf who Dritz killed in a misunderstanding during the Hunter's Blades novels. The other plot thread follows a, another surf, surface drow who was introduced during that storyline, or at least featured prominently, Tosin Armgo, who had been allied with Obuld but was now on the run. Over the course of the earlier stories, he'd acquired Katie Bree's St. Jean's Sword Casadea, Casade, and his plot thread involves his interactions with the sword and the, their psychic struggle for dominance. On the one hand, Dritz's plot thread involves his and Inovendil's reconnaissance of the territory of Obuld, and with Dritz suspecting that the goodly races would have to respect the territories claimed by Obuld, and that under his guidance and leadership, that's Obuld's, not Dritz, Obuld's kingdom could become a power as worthy of respect as the other kingdoms of Ferun, while as part of this, Inovendil has to come to grapple with her prejudice against orcs, and whether she's willing to accept the concept of not just a orcish kingdom on their on her people's doorstep, but a orcish kingdom that her people would have to respect. On the other hand, we have the internal struggle of Tosin and Kazadea. Um, I apologize for mispronouncing that. On the one hand, the sword seeks battle, being a sword, while Tosin has grown somewhat tired of conflict and seeks to step away from the bloodshed. Ice T nails the reading on this. I remember hearing about and reading his tweets over struggling with pronouncing Dungeons and Dragons names, something I completely get having had arguments with friends in middle school, and for that matter high school, over how you pronounce various words from D&D, but Ice T really gets every character in the story and nails all of them, especially the conflict between Tosin and Casadilla. He gets them so well that I don't know which fantasy series I'd like to hear him do an audiobook for more. For the Elric series, with him getting into the conflicts between Elric and Stormbringer? Or the Fafford and the Grey Mauser series, with the interplay between those two characters and their chemistry? This leads to two remaining stories with some of the strongest performances of the book. The first is read by an actor who I expected to blow it out of the water, Will Whedon, who reads, If They Happen Upon My Lair. The story follows the attempted conquest of the Bloodstone Lands by the Lich Zengi, along with his dragon allies, who he'd offered to give the power to become the dragon uh, from a Dracolich. This is, narratively, the darkest story of the work, with the most protagonist deaths of every story in the set, complete with the Game of Thrones-esque all these characters we've carefully introduced are killed in a horrific fashion, cold open. Will nails the reed, and his voices for the worm Oshala and the Yitch Lich Zengi sound absolutely fantastic in a the reader probably wrecked their voice reading these lines kind of way. It is really impressive, and I feel like I owe Will a bunch of tea with honey as gratitude for his excellent performance. If uh Finally, we have Arula Dune, read by Michael Chiklis. The story is set during the Spell Plague, which is the period of time basically bridging the gap between third and second edition, the third and fourth edition of Dungeons and Dragons in the Forgotten Realms, and basically exists to explain narratively the mechanical changes to the magic and rule system and how, why things are different in Forgotten Realms, and follows a Elven Ranger who is not Drist and a magic user ending up on the island of Arula Dune near the Dale, Ice and Dales, where they learn that a magical forest has been created by Meliki, the goddess of nature, and in that forest they find the spirit of Regis the Halfling. The story is somewhat bittersweet, as it's not clear to me whether Regis had died on screen by the time the story is published, or this was the reveal of his death. However, what makes the story stand out is Chiklis's performance in reading the story. He, like Ice-T, and like Will Wheaton, blows this work out of the water, perhaps actually more than everyone else, because he is chameleon-like in his performance. I know Chiklis as a tough guy actor, who's working on The Shield, through his playing Ben Grimm in The Fantastic Four, but here he vanishes utterly 
into the role. He just appears in the work to a tremendous degree. And I did some research on IMDb and discovered he has done a whole bunch of voice acting work. And I kind of want to hear him do more voice acting work because it is amazing how just much listening to this, you don't realize that this is Detective Mackey, that this is Ben Grimm reading the story. It's just a story being told to great effect. And the voice of the characters just fit and flow into each other wonderfully. Hell, I want to hear Michael Chiklis do more audiobooks. Because this, if his rest of his performances are like this one, then he's going to be amazing. So that's my thoughts on The Legend of Drifts, the collected anthology. If you've experienced the work, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts as well, so feel free to post them below in the comments. And uh, if you have your favorite particular audiobook readers and works where the material and reader mesh together seamlessly, I'd be interested to hear that as well. And once again, let post in the comments. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospective, if you want to go see it or view previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everyone. Once again, thank you very much for watching. See you next time.